Thank you very much. Merci infiniment, Hillel, de cet honneur remarquable. Et vos excellences, rabbins distingués, chers mesdames et messieurs, uh, thank you so much for this uh, great tribute that I accept really on behalf of all of my colleagues in the government of Canada, including those who are represented here tonight. And let me, I know that, I know that we've already all, it sounds like a Canadian party tonight, <laughs> and it is. Um, where's the maple syrup, by the way? Um, I, I want to really thank my colleague uh, and dear friend, uh, the Honorable Rana Ambrose, our Minister of Health, uh, for being here. Rana's actually here on uh, World Health Organization meetings, but uh, it's very uh, fortuitous that she could be with us this evening because one of her issues of uh, personal emphasis in her political vocation has been the plight of women in the, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. So, Rana, thank you for your championing the women of Iran. Thank you so much. And it's also wonderful to be joined by two outstanding representatives of Canada, our ambassador to the UN agencies here in Geneva, Alyssa Goldberg, and our ambassador to the World Trade Organization, Jonathan Freed. These are two examples of Canada's very best on the world stage. And, and Ambassador Goldberg, I'm so delighted to hear about the constructive partnership that you've struck up with your mission and UN Watch to help amplify the voices of people who would otherwise be voiceless here at the international platform of the UN Council on Human Rights. And of course, I also want to acknowledge and thank another distinguished Canadian, uh, Marina Nemat. So here we are in Geneva with two Canadian ministers, two Canadian ambassadors, two Canadian award recipients, it sounds like a little bit of nepotism, Hillel, that you're a Canadian bringing us all together. And it's certainly proof, if anyone ever doubted it, of the conspiracy for Canadian global domination. <laughs> which, which must be the most unlikely conspiracy ever. So, um, But I do really want to say a special word of... Uh, uh, recognition to Marina Nemat, who, as we've all seen here tonight, is a remarkable witness. Uh, a, I uh, can't receive a courage for moral, uh, an award for moral courage in her presence. She personifies a courage. Uh, Marina, the great uh, Czech novelist Milan Kundera once wrote that the the struggle of remembering against forgetting is the struggle of freedom against tyranny. And for people like you who have lived, who've gone through the, the valley of the shadow of death and who have chosen life, it requires, I know, a deliberate and often painful choice every day to remember, and not just to remember, but to remember actively, to remember as your vocation and to be a, a witness of a terrible evil and so we honor you as a Canadian. We honor you as a champion of human dignity. And we know that someday justice will be done for the people of Iran and your friends who did not survive. One of whom was not a personal friend of yours, but your testimony brought to mind uh, a Iranian Canadian woman named Zara Kazami, who went back to be a witness she was a photojournalist, and in 2005, she returned to Iran to record through her photographic art the democratic longings of the Iranian people, the persecution of gays and lesbians, of Baha'is and Christians and religious minorities of women and dissidents. And because of her moral courage, because of her witness of truth to power, she was arrested and imprisoned in the same Evan prison in Tehran that Marina found herself. And she was tortured, and she was ultimately murdered by a man named Syed Mortazavi, who was the then prosecutor general of the Islamic Republic in Tehran. I mention this because the story is so resonant, your story is so resonant of that of Zara Kazami, but I can tell you that when our government came to office in 2006, we learned a few months later that Syed Mordezavi 
was coming to Geneva to participate with the Iranian delegation at the hearings of the UN Human Rights Council. And that one story tells you all you need to know about why we need UN Watch, why we need to hold that and similar bodies accountable, why we need, when others would listen to the seductive voice of uh, diplomatic politesse, why sometimes we need a Hillel Neuer standing at the microphone as an observer calling people to account for allowing monsters like Zayed Mordazavi to have a microphone at a body dedicated to human rights. It's wrong, and UN, rights, UN Watch is right to call those people to account. Let me say, by the way, incidentally, the story didn't end there, because when we learned that the murderer of our Canadian citizen, Zara Kazami, was here in Geneva, we also learned through Iranian dissident networks that he planned to travel through Germany back uh, to Tehran. And we sought a novel, never before used, legal mechanism to have him arrested and indicted for crimes of murdering, for the charge of murdering a Canadian. Uh, in Tehran. He caught wind of our efforts and so managed to fly back under the shelter of diplomatic immunity directly um, from Switzerland. But that is an example about how working together, a, a principled government, working together with dissidents and victims of monsters like Mordazevi, with, uh, with the assistance of organizations like UN Watch, we can hold the perpetrators to account. You know, and I remember in 2006, I had a meeting with members of the Persian community at the University of Toronto about trying to get another one of your champions of Iranian democracy, Professor Ramin Jahanbaglu, out of Evan prison. And I had interesting advice from some officials about how we had to be gentle and polite and diplomatic. And then I heard from Persian Canadians who had gone through experiences like you who said, no, the only thing that will stop people like Mordazavi is the knowledge, even if it's a quiet voice in the back of their mind, that someday there will be a reckoning, someday there will be an accounting. They know full well, full well that their regime, the regime of the Islamic Republic, has a date limit on it. They don't know when that date is, none of us do. But they must understand that we all will work together to hold the criminals to account for what they did to your childhood friend, for what they did to Zara Kazimi. And again, Hillel, thank you for being a voice through this organization for all of those people. Now, you just saw that video about um, Richard Falk. Uh, he was, of course, a United Nations the Special Rapporteur at the Human Rights Council, who had not only praised the 9-11 conspiracy theorists, but had openly suggested that the United States provoked acts of terrorism against itself. Uh, at the time, as you saw, I responded to Richard Falk, saying that he should be fired from his post at the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, what had likely raised Richard Falk's ire against this organization by the way, to its great credit, is that UN Watch is focused on a very, is, is doggedly, consistently focused on a very simple objective, which is to hold the United Nations to account to its own stated principles found in its founding charter, such as at the first words in the preamble of the UN Charter from 1945, that the United Nations is found, founded to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person. And I was reading those words earlier today, preparing for this. It, it brought to mind an experience I had three years ago. I was in Beijing on a government bilateral trip and uh, received a peculiar invitation to meet with the public security minister uh, of 
the Chinese Politburo, Zhu Yongkong. Now, for those of you who know Chinese politics, Zhu Yongkong was the hardliner of the hardliners. Zhu Yongkong was responsible more than anyone for the violent uh, uh, oppression, for example, of the uh, Falun Gong, Falun Dafa practitioners, of Tibetans, of dissidents, of uh, unregulated faith groups. And I thought it was peculiar. I didn't have any direct ministerial link with Zhu Yongkong. I was Minister of Immigration. He was the State Secretary for Public Security. He invited me over to his offices in his motorcade, which was an interesting trip. The car, the car caught on fire on the way there. And when we began our visit after the media left, normally, uh, as our ambassadors here will know, when you're engaging Chinese officials, there's a kind of diplomatic, a long and elaborate, ornate process of diplomatic niceties. But he immediately said to me, Mr. Kenny, through his translator, we understand that you are an expert on so-called human rights. Can you please explain to me what are these human rights? <laughs> yes, that was, I, I was as shocked as, as, as some of you are. And I thought, where is this going? And I said, well, minister, these human rights are a reflection of the innate, inalienable dignity of the human person, and they are the property, the inalienable property of all human people, including the Chinese people. They're not the invention of Western liberal democracies. They are a birthright of all men and women. His next response to me, his response was, well, minister, we understand that you are a friend of the, uh, the so-called Lama of the Dalai sect. I'm obliged to inform you that he is a slave-owning tyrant who's responsible for, who has blood on his hands and is a dangerous, dangerous splittist. And we, we went on to have, let's say, a rather vigorous 45-minute discussion about human rights in China. And for me to think that his government was represented on the UN Human Rights Council when he was essentially mocking the very principles upon which the United Nations was founded. The reaffirmation of the faith and fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person. Now, one of the great uh, privileges I've had for the past several years has been acting as Canada's Minister for Multiculturalism. Some of you may have, uh, multiculturalism is a concept not terribly popular in much of Western Europe these days, but it actually is, perhaps uniquely, still very popular in Canada. It is a, a deeply ingrained part of our political culture. It's ingrained in our DNA, accommodation of differences, mutual respect, unity in diversity. And it's reinforced by wave after waves of immigrants. We have maintained the highest levels of immigration in the developed world, and we receive more resettled refugees per capita, like Marina, than any other country on the face of the earth, many of them victims of warfare, violence, ethnic cl cleansing, and torture. And somehow we have figured out a way to live together. Not just to live together, but at our best, to celebrate and understand one another's differences and to, and to constantly strive for unity in our diversity. And so, because we regard ourselves as having a special vocation as champions of pluralism, we, as a country, were particularly disturbed to see the distortion of discussions about racial prejudice and pluralism at the United Nations through the Durban process. And that is why, as Hillel mentioned, ours was the first country in the world to announce our withdrawal from the Durban II process because it, the evidence was clear to us at the time that it was going to be in large measure a replay of the worst aspects, some of the worst aspects of Durban I. And it's also why we were the first country in the world to withdraw from Durban III. Ambassador, I would point out, we were far ahead of Israel in both instances. I don't know, but I'm glad that Israel caught up with us and eventually withdrew in both cases. When I announced our withdrawal from Durban II, I said the following, our government has lost faith in the Durban process. We will not be part of this event. 
which commemorates an agenda that promotes racism rather than combats it. Canada will not participate in this charade any longer. The government of Canada will not lend Canada's good name to the organized exercise in scapegoating that is the Durban process. Our government has lost faith um, and, sorry, our, our decision to boycott Durban II was vindicated when former President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad used the occasion of Hitler's birthday, that's the, the date of his speech, to single out the only democratic pluralist nation in the region and accuse it of, quote, a kind of racism which has an ugliness that has completely distorted the honor of mankind at the verge of the third millennium, and, and it, the Zionist entity, has made the global society shameful, close quote. The words of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad at a UN platform. This was just the high, highest profile outrage at a conference that was, like its predecessor in 2001, blighted by crude anti-Semitism and bully tactics by some of the most dangerous and law lawless nations in the world. I'm sure, I'm sure that you know well the litany of abuses and outrages that marred the two previous Durban conferences. The reemergence of the Zionism is racism canard, calls for the eradication of a member state of the United Nations, vulgar displays of Nazi imagery in so-called spontaneous protests, anti-Semitic tracts being distributed by some of the many extremist NGOs accredited to attend, and on and on. And still, two debacles wasn't enough for the participants. Instead of admitting their errors, the organizers of Durban II patted themselves on the back and hailed it as a brave step forward to Durban III. Sadly, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, expressed, quote, shock and de deep disappointment at the decision of Canada and eight other liberal democracies to withdraw from Durban II. She said at the time that, quote, a handful of states have permitted one or two issues to dominate their approach to this issue, allowing them to outweigh the concerns of numerous groups of people. So let's get this straight the top UN human rights official was shocked and disappointed by the absence at Durban II of several pluralistic liberal democracies with the world's strongest protections for civil and human rights, countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Israel, and yet did, she did not express a syllable of dismay that the conference was organized by some of the world's most notorious human rights abusers with Gaddafi's Libya in the lead, ably assisted by Ahmadinejad Iran as vice chair, with Castro's Cuba pitching in as rapporteur. By the way, I, I recall being at an international conference in London around this time, just after we announced our withdrawal from Durban II, and a minister of a, another government, uh, who I won't mention for diplomatic reasons, came up to me and said, why exactly uh, have you Canadians decided to do this? And I thought for a moment, I said, well, listen, I could give you an hour's worth of reasons as to why we've withdrawn from Durban, but I'll save both of us a lot of time and just give you one. Iran is the vice chair of the conference. The argument is over. But the denial of reality is at the root of that process. Indeed, the hallmark of the Durban process is an almost pathological refusal to see things as they are. In the world of that process, the blame is always external. The fault always lies with someone else, preferably someone with deep pockets. So don't hold your breath waiting for, uh, a, 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 well, I would hope eventually a change in, in direction. Uh, I would hope that there is recognition that responsibility for ending the violence in the Middle East falls on Hamas and Hezbollah and the regimes who supply them with the weapons of terror. But it's easier to, blame, to, to pin the blame for historical wrongs of liberal democracies uh, on, on the liberal democracies rather than on regimes that exploit the wretched of the earth today. But Canada will not be deter deterred. Uh, though we will not support an agenda that exculpates undemocratic and oppressive regimes or glosses over violence against Israel, we will continue to be leaders in the global fight against racial injustice and the new anti-Semitism. What do I mean by the new anti-Semitism? I mean the growing acceptance of the unique vilification of Israel and the new apologetics that tries to hide or explain away the underlying anti-Semitism. 
In Nazi Germany, Jews were stripped of their citizenship, denied their natural rights, and ultimately exterminated. Today, there are those who are trying to strip the state of Israel of its citizenship in the international community, minimize its natural rights as a sovereign state, and even deny its right to exist. The new anti-Semitism has adopted more sophisticated language than the old Der Sturmer, caricatures and blood libels. Its rhetoric is now dressed up in the fashionable anti-American and anti-Western jargon of far-left ideology. Instead of targeting Jewish people, it now targets the Jewish homeland, but it ultimately espouses the same ancient hate, hatred and the old intent. Of course, criticism of Israel cannot in and of itself be regarded as anti-Semitic. However, if and when that criticism selectively condemns, selectively condemns and denies the only Jewish state's right to exist, it cannot be considered anything but anti-Semitic. This is why Canada has made teaching future generations the lessons of the Holocaust and the effects of anti-Semitism one of our principal objectives. We were honored in the last year to chair the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance to massively improve our own uh, Holocaust education and research efforts to offer Canada as a best practice to countries like Ukraine. It's why we're building a museum of human rights in Winnipeg at the center of which will be the consequences and uh, the causes and consequences of the Holocaust. It's why we've recognized our own subtle history of uh, anti-Semitism that barred European Jewish refugees from can coming to Canada during the Second World War. And it's why we stand unequivocally, shoulder to shoulder, with the democratic Jewish state of Israel today. The hypocrisy of the enemies of freedom is sometimes breathtaking, but it's the natural consequence of some ideologue's cynical approach to human rights. And so let me tell you that as long as the international community persists in rewarding serial rights abusers with seats on its Human Rights Council and giving them a microphone at conferences like Durban, Canada will object. Under the current arrangement, countries such as Canada must join with like-minded nations to uphold the principles of freedom, civil society, and the rule of law where we can, and to refuse to participate when it's clear that these principles will be ignored or distorted. That is why Canada boycotted, for example, the UN conference on disarmament when North Korea was named its chair. Uh, and it's why when Canada saw that Durban III would repeat some of the mistakes of its predecessors, we refused to give it the imprimatur of our presence. So Canada will no longer make the mistake of confusing process with results or participation with action. Most importantly, we will not be afraid to stand on principle and defend our own interests and those of our friends. As Prime Minister Stephen Harper has said, Canada has a purpose in the world. Quotes, and that purpose is no longer just to go along, to get along with everyone else's agenda. It is no longer to please every dictator with a vote at the United Nations. And I confess that I don't know why past attempts to do so were ever thought to be in Canada's national interest. He went on to say, now, we know where our interests lie and who our friends are. And we take strong principled positions in our dealings with other nations, whether popular or not. And that is what the world can count on from Canada. So I'm proud to repeat those words to you today. And I'm proud to receive this award on behalf of all of my colleagues and Prime Minister Harper to wish you continued success to Hillel and the entire team uh, as they uh, continue to be uh, a voice for the voiceless and to speak truth to power. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup.